Are you searching for fulfillment? <laughs> Discover true happiness. Stay tuned to Shalom World. I grew up with a lot of anger in my heart. I didn't even realize how much rage and anger was there because that was my norm. I was born into that. Becoming Catholic taught me so much about myself. I'm Lisa Campbell. I'm a wife, a mother of three. I live in Michigan, but I was raised in California. I was raised through Pentecostal churches, and we went to church all the time, but I didn't believe in God. God wasn't in my home, and we had a lot of abuse. That was my norm, abuse, criminal activity, a lot of dysfunctionalism. I have six siblings. Most of us have different dads. I have my own dad. I didn't meet my dad until I was 17 years old. He was in prison for murder for several years. So I grew up underneath a stepdad that was abusive, that was a child molester. And my, I had asked my mom one time when I was nine if why he was in our lives and why didn't she kick him out. And she had said to me that God sent him to us to help pay the bills. Um, because my mom was on welfare and we lived in poverty. And so it was really confusing for me who God was. So the more I grew up in chaos in my home, fights, cops were always at our house. It pushed me out into the streets where I felt more comfortable. And I hung out with a lot of people that introduced me to partying, fighting. I was skipping school all the time. I was always the person that ride or die friend that <laughs> if you asked me to do anything, I would do it. So at the age of 13, 14, 15, I started cocaine, meth, um, on a regular basis, sniffing glue, stuff like that in classes. And I had no care. I had nothing to lose. I wasn't, I had no fear to die. I had no fear of going to prison. And eventually I started selling drugs a little bit here and there, small time. And then I started selling myself for drugs, started sleeping around and sleeping with people I didn't even know their names. Um, they would offer me drugs and I would give them sex in return. And um, it was a lot of that type of prostitution um, lifestyle um, and just really self-destructive. Eventually, I moved to another town and I met somebody when I was 17 years old. And that was an abusive relationship, but it didn't show up that way at first. Again, my norm was certain characteristics in people, so I didn't see those signs, those red flags. And this person had a nice car. Um, he wasn't as violent up front. Um, he graduated from high school. He had a job. He had stability. All things that I grew up that I did not have. Um, he tried talking me out of doing drugs. Um, he never partied in that way, so I thought he was safe. And it was not a safe relationship. It was a very physically and sexually and emotionally abusive relationship. We were together for approximately four years, um, and he would make me do porn movies. Um, so that 
um, part of my life escalated into a lot of sexual addiction issues. Um, and if I didn't sleep when he slept, I can get beat. If I wasn't awake when he was awake, I could get beat. If um, I didn't want to take a shower at the time he wanted me to take a shower, I could get beat. Um, he would do a lot of just crazy stuff, lock me outside of the our apartments and uh, butt naked and try to humiliate me. And um, he would, if we were painting a room, he would pour paint on me and throw me outside to sit on the steps in cold weather and just laugh from the window and just bizarre things like that. He liked to do torturous and torment me. And um, and he tried to break me and he would tie me up. When There was a time he tied me up to the bed and he carved the word devil in my, um, in my chest and he poured hot wax on that open wound. The burning and the physical pain was just intolerable, but there was something spiritual about that as well. I just felt this demonic spirit. And so I'd always been around darkness. I'd always been around the demonic, obviously through abuse and addictions around my house. But it, so it was through all the darkness and those demonic activities that told me there must be a God. He forced me into two abortions. That was hard. I did have a child from him, and I fought to keep him. I didn't want to have an, an, another abortion, so I lied on how far along I was. Um, he tried beating me to lose the baby. He tried pushing me down steps, suffocating me, making me drink tons of alcohol, um, choking me in bathtubs, and I was scared. And I was worried that one day I would have this child and it could come out abnormal through all that. But there was something in me again of something good that I had to fight for that chance. I had to fight for life, my son's life and my life. So then um, my son was two years old. I did have him. And his aunt, my son's dad, took a vacation to the Midwest and for two weeks and said they would be back in two weeks. They didn't return. My son's dad decided um, to move to the Midwest. And he said, if I ever wanted to see my son again, I had to move as well. So I had to pick up and leave California and move to the Midwest. I had no friends, no family. Um, and I was scared and nervous because it was such an abusive relationship. I knew that he would have me even more so under his control and power. And that's exactly what happened and what he did. And so when we moved to the Midwest, we got into more, the, our physical altercations escalated. And there was a time that my son was two years old and my son's dad pushed me down the stairs and he's had my son beat me with him saying, bad mommy, bad mommy, she doesn't listen. She's a bad person. And it was in that moment that I knew I had to leave. And I knew I had to leave without my son because I had no money, no job, no, no support system. How am I going to support him? But it was life or death for me. And it was a hard decision to leave. Um, I didn't have a family that would help and support. So I left my son with him promising that I would bring, promising that I would go back for him to get him back. So when I went back, um, I wasn't able to get him back. And, and the police department at the time said, you don't have a job, you don't have any money, you don't have a way to support him, you can't take your son. They didn't let me. So in the state of Michigan, um, if the child is, whoever the child's in the presence of at the time has legal custody. If you haven't been married and there's no custody. So for about nine, 10 years, my son's dad had that hold on me and kept him, pretty much kidnapped him for a while, didn't let me see him for months. I didn't know where my son was. It, I was in torment. Um, I had to make a life in Michigan. I had no winter clothes coming from California, being a Cali girl. Um, I had no job, no money. I had to buy some cheap Kmart little shoes. Um, and I would walk up and down this unsafe neighborhood, take the first bus out to get a job. 
um, in t different temp agency offices. And I would take the last bus in and I would walk through the snow. I didn't own a coat and I'd have to save up money for a coat. I had to save up money for winter clothes. I had to save up money for a car. And I didn't get to see my son through a lot of that. I lived in hope and one day I knew I would get him back. So I would visit my son at different times. His dad would let me visit him if I gave him sex or money. That was a condition. Um, and again, we didn't have a custody order because I didn't have money to hire an attorney. So my breaking point one day was doing that for several years. At this time, I, I met my husband, who I'm still married to today. We've been married for 18 years. Thanks be to God. Very patient man. <laughs> um, and at the time, I was married now to my husband, and I have two kids through this marriage. And my son's dad didn't like that I met this man. So he started pulling back visits, and he would say, if you're not here by 5 p.m., you can't see your son. I would run, like, I live 25 minutes away, commute, and I would kill everybody on the road, and I would try to get there on time. And sometimes he'd be there, sometimes he wouldn't. And he wouldn't let me see him on Mother's Day. He wouldn't let me have him for Christmases. And those were really hard times. And this one time was the moment, the moment that changed my life. And I went back to church and gave my life to God, um, was I went to go see my son. I got there 10 minutes before five and he was gone. And I called him and said, where are you? Like, I'm early, I'm, I'm 10 minutes early. And I killed everybody on the road to get here. And he said, how does it feel to want something you can't have? And um, now you know how it feels. And I cracked. And I just wanted to kill myself. Um, I wanted to just give up life. I couldn't do it anymore with uh, being under his control and power. Here I am married. I'm, I have a decent job, an office job. I'm trying to be a better person. I'm trying to do right. And I still don't have my son. I still am under this man's control. And I said, so I'm crying on the freeway. And I said, God, if you are real, if you truly exist, the God that church taught me about, obviously not my home, the God that was preached to me, if you're real, help, show me. And right then and there, I something prompted me to call my mom. We're not close, so that was definitely a prompting from the Holy Spirit. Um, I keep my distance. It's hard for me to be close with my family. And something just kept nudging me, and nudging me, and I'm like, I'm not calling. Finally, I called, and she said, I can't believe you called today of all days. I just got a warning. My lawsuit was just released to me. She was in a car accident and she came into a million dollars. And I told her how I felt and I was crying and I was at everything. And she says, I will wire you the money to hire an attorney and to get your baby back on one condition. You need to go back to church. And I thought, are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> and part of me thought, oh, well, we're, we're six states away. How is she going to know? I could just lie and say, oh yeah, I'll, I'll go back to church. And um, she, she'll never know. <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, I promise I'll go back to church. And she says, find a church and I'll wire you the money. Sure enough, I found a church. It was Assemblies of God Church, which is Pentecostal. And I started going there. And part of me thought, Lisa, you don't have to be here. She doesn't know. You can just lie, you know, and she's your mom. Like, because I didn't ha have a lot of respect for her. So if I lied, it wouldn't have bothered me. Um, but something didn't let that go. Something just kept drawing me back to that church. I would go late and leave early. <laughs> I would sit in the very far back, but I, at least I went. And um, and there was this woman that would always come to me and try to pull me away. And Lisa, you know what? I'll watch your daughter, you know, in the hallway, you stay in church. And she would, if I missed a day or Sunday, she would say, where were you? And so then, so she really, really was this annoying church lady that kept evangelizing me to death. And I would sit there and go, God, just, I would try to pray her away. Everybody's praying for the gift of the Holy Spirit, all these other things. I was praying this woman away. <laughs> and the more I did that, the more she would sit next to me and she would find me. But it was that woman that helped me open my heart and my life 
to the graces that were there and to this community that was so loving and embracing. And I started, they started praying with me for to get my son through the custody case. Uh, thanks be to God, long story short, um, breakthrough. I did get custody of my son. Um, through all those prayer times, every single Sunday, these women would come around me, they would pray over me and pray with me, and I became part of the community. I became really involved in church, and the more I became involved in church and doing youth ministry, I was a youth minister volunteer, I started reading my Bible more, and another um, conversion moment was when the youth pastor would text us and email us and say, how was your time with Jesus today? And I just remember thinking, I don't know, like, how is my time with Jesus today? You know, he would say, what is the word saying to you today? What's what's God saying to you today? What's God speaking to you? And and because I don't like to, I'm, I'm pretty competitive, <laughs> and I don't like to be wrong, or I don't like to, you know, um, miss out, or I like to live up to par. I like to live up to all the rules. If my church community says, we, we don't allow this, I don't do it. They say, we allow this, I do it. I follow the rules. And so when he said those questions, he would question us, I knew I had to go deeper because I wanted to hear what God was saying. I wanted to have an answer for Him the next time He asked me. And so I started reading my Bible more. I started learning. Um, I would really digest the Old Testament. And I would just be consumed with the New Testament in ways that I started looking at my church and thinking, wait a minute, that doesn't look like what I'm reading in the Bible. And so then I started questioning my faith. and. And God started putting the Catholic Church on my heart, and I started growing deeper in Word, but I started growing further away from my church, who I, that I loved, and that was such a family to me, and such a critical part of my life. And I had to let that go because God was calling me into truth. I couldn't deny that the full truth was in the Catholic Church. So I came into the Catholic Church in 2010, thanks be to God. It was a hard and long journey, and I was really excited because in my Pentecostal faith, we always talk about, um, it's under the blood, it's under the blood, the blood of Jesus this, the blood of Jesus that, and here I was thinking, wow, I actually get to drink and you know eat the body of Christ and drink the, you know, the blood of Jesus that we would, we would talk about, and the real presence. and. And I was just really excited. And, and so I fasted because God put the scripture on my heart, um, can't pour new wine into old wineskin. And I just really wanted to be made new. And so I re when I received the Eucharist at Easter Vigil, it truly was such a deep encounter with Jesus in a deeper way that I'd ever, more than I could have ever imagined. During the time in, R in RCAA, I would sit there in the pews at my parish and I would cry and weep seeing all these people receive the Eucharist and I couldn't. And it just built up that hunger and that longing and desire for that. And so I started going to daily Mass after becoming Catholic. Um, after Easter Vigil, I started going to daily Mass, 6.30 Mass every morning, and I would get there an hour before. And I would be at the doors, <laughs> uh, waiting through snow, ice, whatever. I could not wait to receive the Eucharist each day. And um, and we, there's no homily, there's no music, it's just the Eucharist, you know, it's, it's the 30-minute Mass. And I grew so much more in my faith, in my Catholic faith that way, and just understanding the sacraments, understanding Jesus and the Eucharist in such a way that it really just gave me a desire to understand the sacraments more. And even though I'd overcome a lot of adversity, I've overcome drug addiction and alcohol and li living this wild life, I still had a lot of issues in my life, baggage and stuff. I had sexual addiction. I had, I would get frustrated easy. I had anger issues. And so I would sit there and go to reconciliation. And, and though I felt the grace in that, I just felt like I still couldn't become unbound from that. I would still struggle. So one day I was crying out going, okay, Lord, I went through all this. And so I felt like the Lord was showing me to work on my brain chemicals, on the neurotransmitters. And so I started eating healthy and started doing research on that. I, I didn't really know how to do that because I didn't go to school and, and I just felt like I wasn't educated in that area. So I started working on just emotional intelligence, you know, awareness of what 
triggers are in my life that trigger these kind of habits and these weaknesses and these sins. And then um, that just really helped me and it helped the dopamine levels and the serotonin levels and the endorphin levels. So that way they didn't over flood in my brain in an imbalanced way and, and then I'd fall into sin. And it's, it's kind of complicated to get into, but it really did help me balance my brain cells in a way that those triggers were now neutralized. I share my Catholic faith with everybody, store clerks, retail clerks, people on the street, anywhere I can. If people say, how was your day today? I'll say, oh my gosh, it was great. And I don't know if you have a faith, but can I tell you that I received the Eucharist today? I'm Catholic, and I received Holy Communion, which is the Eucharist, and I start telling them about it. Um, I love sharing my Catholic faith. Um, becoming Catholic taught me so much about myself and taught me, I always would hear in my Pentecostal church that we need to love more and about identity crisis. But learning about church history and learning my identity through the lens of a Catholic really helped me understand and see myself, who, my true identity in Christ in a more clear way. It gave me the grace to see myself the way Jesus sees, my, sees me. And it's just really humbling to be in the pews before the Blessed Sacrament or in Holy Mass and to understand the Holy Ma Sacrifice of the Mass in such a way that helps me and equips me. It's His worship that we partner with. And Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday are all intertwined in Easter Sunday in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. So the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass in the Eucharist helps me each time I'm there to understand and to go through situations when I feel betrayed, betrayal in the deepest way, in the most wounding, hurtful way. I go to the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, I look at the Eucharist, and I receive the Eucharist, and I know that that Eucharist is built around betrayal and being crucified by others. But there's a grace in that, and there's, there's resurrecting power in that. And that's what it does for me. It teaches me how to not just go through situations, but grow through them. To all of the viewers of Shalom TV throughout the world, I want to encourage you not only to support this amazing media apostolate, but to spread the word to others. We all know how the internet and mass media are polluting the world with the poison of pornography and so much other forms of materialism. This is the source of eternal life, the gospel, and Shalom TV is consecrated to spreading the word of Christ. Thank you.